Hello everybody, Jordan here, the PH is silent, and in this episode of the Saturday Morning D&D Show, we talk about the new nautical-themed book that was secretly announced by Wizards of the Coast, as well as how long should you run your RPG sessions, and plans for 2019. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Saturday Morning D&D Show. My name is Jordan with a silent PH in the middle, and I hit my light as I was so excited. And I am joined always by my wonderful co-host, Sir Lucian, over there at Sir Lucian Gaming. Say hello, sir. Hello. I should bump my mic and throw stuff around. Yeah, I was like, I was too excited, and I and then the light, yeah, it's going to be... I. I need to fix my my lights. I bought these uh <laughs> these like paper lanterns to kind of diffuse yeah. the light and they're really good, but they're right there. Like mm, and I I hit them a lot when I yawn and stretch or get excited about Saturday morning D&D because that is why we are here ladies and gentlemen. Uh we're we excited. are going to chat with you about the state of Dungeons and Dragons, games that we play, various other topics that pop into our head. Because before the thing even started, Lucian and I were talking about um, Magic the Gathering. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that, that's always fun. But it's relevant because it's Guilds of Ravnica that we were talking yeah. about. So it was relevant in that way. But uh, yeah, I see Cyberwolf out there, DM Allen, Greybeard's Tavern, Mr. Buildwell, all Skull Dixon's even out there. So a lot of our regulars, it's good to see you guys. Yeah, always fun to have you guys here. So thank you. Good morning. Uh, happy 2019, everybody. Um, we've we've done it. We've survived five days so far. So 2019 <laughs> is hopefully won't be the dumpster fire that 2018 was for a lot of people. But uh, we're, we're excited. Um, and there's lots of D and D stuff going to happen in 2019 oh, yeah. um, with us too. Like uh, I know you've got games planned, and we've mm -hmm. all got ideas and stuff going. Kind of percolating for for various projects in the future so i'm ex i'm really excited about 2019 so yeah and we got lots of guests we're making a big push to bring lots of guests that was a big request for the show this year um so we're gonna do some more of that i'm sure we're gonna put some more content up on the saturday morning D, &D show channel just to get some more stuff for you guys to watch out there and i know me and jordan are really gonna be doing more streaming than we did last year just because, you know, we had such a good year last year, we're going to keep keep it up. And there's a lot coming. We've got games happening on other channels, people coming to our channel to do stuff, and it's just going to be really good. Yeah, super fun. Uh, I'm excited for the guests. Um, yes. And we won't announce anything just yet, but we have, we're going to try and do it at the end of the month uh, is, is, the, is the goal, to have one guest a month kind of a thing. So uh, we had uh, Pruitt, and we are lining up others, and, and we'll, we'll see what happens. Don't hold us to that, because, you know, they can always say no, yeah. <laughs> and, and maybe it won't happen, uh, which I think happened with Colville. We were all like, yeah, he's coming on this day. We're going to, like, promote the hell out of it. And then he's like, actually, I can't do it that day. And we had yeah. to move it to another week, and we're like, oh, it's a false alarm, everybody, <laughs> false alarm. <laughs> But but it was great, and we were happy he was on there, and it yes. was one of our best shows ever uh, as far as wa people watching and tuning in and coming and checking the, the whole channel out. It was great. He has said he will come back on the channel, so it is my hope, like Jordan just said, don't hold us to it, but it's my hope that we have Matt Colville back yeah. this year, 2019. Yep. That'll be fun. Um, he's he's just a super cool guy, fun to talk to, so we'll see. Yeah. Um, the world of Dungeons and Dragons got yes. a spoiler swag show, which is uh, Nathan and Kate Welch. Mm -hmm. Not Nathan Welch, but Nathan. I don't know his last name. And Kate Welch. Um, <laughs> they uh, they just give away stuff on the D&D Twitch stream and kind of talk about uh, spoilers and things, projects that are coming. And they answer a bunch of questions. Or I should say they don't answer questions because I had a, like a bunch of questions. I was I was live in chat watching them and I was asking yeah. questions and I even had people like point out, they're like, that was a really good question. And I'm like, I know. And they keep ignoring it. Like they just don't want to answer it. Uh, but they have their secrets and their reasons, so we can't really be too upset with them. Um, yeah. But they are releasing a new book that should be out, I think, by the end of the month. They're going to have an official announcement for it. And then they were saying that it's going to go off to the printers and be available maybe March? Mm. I'm not really sure. I can't remember off the top of my head. But it is. Uh, it doesn't have a, a definitive name yet, which was what they were doing on the show is they were coming out and they're saying, well, does this name work or does this name work? One of the names was Under the Sea. 
One of the mm-hmm. names was uh, like Walk the Plank or something. One of them was Boats and Shite. Boats and Shite. Like the whatever. But it's nautical themed and every everything that she presented, like here's a possible title and artwork had, and I'm going to read it off of it over here. So that's why I'm looking this way. Um, it said everything you need to float your boat in the greatest role-playing game in the world. So that was all they really hinted at is that we're going to get some kind of nautical book. And I know mm-hmm. they've, correct me if I'm wrong, Lucian, but they came out with some, they being Wizards of the Coast, came out with some uh, boat mechanics recently for Unearthed Arcana. Yeah. 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 Yep. It did was you read just, those? I don't think I, I read did. those. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, then we even heard from uh, Mike Merles where he talked, he expanded a little bit on it during the week he was doing his show, but he talked a tiny bit about it. And it, he gave the hint that this was a slim down if you wanted to add vehicles to Dungeons and Dragons. And they were looking at how to add some type of vehicle rules to the system they started with boats, even though it's obvious that they wanted to expand to have, you know, you could have uh, wagons and tanks and whatever it might be, so cars mm-hmm. that are run on magic or, um, you know, some type of, um, could be flying ships, airships, uh, or even maybe spell jammer stuff or any of that. He didn't quite say that stuff, but it gave this impression that there's a hole in the Dungeons and Dragons rule set that deal with vehicular objects of some sort and the best way for them to start testing that was to take ships but that also could lead right into if they're doing a nautical adventure obviously you're going to need ship rules if you're going to do a pirate theme or an undersea theme um is it going to be you know forgotten realms is it going to be a standalone is it going to be some other world that they have? Do they have another world that is very nautical? Was Dragonlance a lot of water? Was Dark Sun? I don't think Dark Sun always felt to me like a desert. No, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's, in um, fact, there's very little water in Dark Sun, I think. Um, yeah. They did say, and I'll interrupt you here uh, because I'm a jerk. Yeah. Yeah, do it. But uh, <laughs> they did say, because um, a lot of people were asking, like, are you going to do any other... Uh, campaign settings and things like that. And they always get asked this, like when is Spelljammer coming? When is Dark Sun coming? And they were basically saying like not in 2019 and that the next adventure will follow a um, timeline of adventures that they have been doing. So, you know, Tomb of Annihilation happens after Out of the Abyss or uh, Out of the Abyss. Yeah. Uh, Storm King's Thunder. And Storm King's Thunder. Ha- yeah. And so they, they they come in a numerical line because they follow a timeline. Like this happens and then Storm King's Thunder and then yeah. Tomb of Annihilation, et cetera, et cetera. So this next one will follow suit and will be the events that occurred after Dungeon of the Mad Mage or after Waterdeep Dragon Heist. So it's with that, they basically said it's still going to be within the world of Faerun. Okay. So um, my question now or my hope i guess is when we were talking before the show started which we have to stop doing that because we have these really great conversations <laughs> and then we're like we need to like like we need to save this for the get for the show yeah. but um is this going to be an, a nautical adventure on the sword coast because that's kind of where all of our adventures have been happening except for cholt um which is far south or are they going to jump us again to a different area um and the sea of fallen stars is this giant like hat sea basically at the center of Faerun and there's all kinds of like pirate activity and sunken ships and sunken cities and merfolk cities. And like, just like if you wanted to have a water adventure, it seems like that would be a great place to have it. And it's a fifth edition unexplored area. Like we haven't mm-hmm. gone over there yet. So I don't know. I'm, I'm wondering like if they're going to, I guess my hope is that we, we shift venues and go to the sea of fallen stars rather than staying on the sword coast like we have been because not that we've done the sword coast to death but like there's been a lot of adventures that have involved that that area of Faerun, and i think they could expand upon it so i almost feel like that's one of your like a personal thing that you hope for just because all of your videos recently have been dealing with that area over they near have Sembia <laughs> and the next video that i'm releasing on yeah. wednesday has also around the but, sea of fallen stars true. but yeah it is definitely true that we've seen a lot of sword coast stuff but there is a lot of Faerun. so there we've kind of not been over to the dale lands for a long time and that area like you said Cormier and, and Simber and I forget Symbia, all these. Yeah. Symbia and, and like all these different ones in the Moonshay and that area. But those were popular parts of Faerun 
just as much or more than the Sword Coast earlier in the 80s or 90s. So it, I wouldn't be surprised if we make a move back over to that at some point and say, hey, here's this whole other part, because then we start getting all the other stuff like Mastika and, and um, all of the different Southlands and the, the across where I'm over in Revnik and Revnar is definitely part of Faerun. You know, that's, that's, mm -hmm. I guess, where I got the name from. And so there's a lot of these other areas that they could go back to and really do a, a full, here's a 2019 edition of, here's a fifth edition of, all these cool box sets that used to come up that were all these different campaigns, yet they still all existed in Faerun. They were all still on yeah. the same planet. So they have a lot, they have such a huge backlog of where they could go. And I do feel like Nathan, who I believe is the, the overall kind of director of their division at the moment, wants to keep diving into the stuff they already have. He's made many mentions of nothing brand new that's never been done because we have so much other stuff we can go back to and and give our version of or do a redo to or do a fifth edition yeah. to that we're working through that even though at some point what would it be like if we got a full-on never before seen world by chris perkins like we get you know green edward gets to do theirs or or all these other people they brought in to do their own worlds what do we get if we get a mike merles a, a chris perkins and um a Jeremy Crawford and a Kate Welch and they get together and they say, okay, you get to build your own world. Now, this is your D and D world. It's going to be at the bottom of the box set where it says by like this author's name, whatever it is, it's your world. We refer to it as the Mike Merle's camp world or whatever. Mm -hmm. What's that going to look like? I, I hope these, this group of D and D people that have revitalized five E for sure brought it from four E you know, kind of, eh, it was okay, but it didn't didn't bring the hobby back. But then 5e brought the hobby back. Give these people a chance to really put their thumbprint on it. I hope we see that at some point. I hope we get to see that and not just let's keep redoing fifth edition versions of what's already happened in the past. Though I do like all of the things they've done with yeah. fifth edition versions of things in the past. So <laughs> Unfortunately, nostalgia is a hell of a drug. And yeah. I think that they're writing that just like, like, the current movies that we're seeing and uh, you know, all the Marvel movies and things like that. Like nobody, nobody wants an original screenplay anymore. They want like, well, was this a show in the eighties? Because then we can turn it into a movie, but it has that fan base already and things like this. Like they know they could go to Spelljammer and dark sun because it has that fan base. So yeah. yeah know, reboot and, yeah. and rehash is definitely popular. I was thinking about uh, just now while you were talking, I was thinking about it. Like we have the sword coast adventures guide. I wonder mm -hmm. if they're going to do a sea of fallen stars adventures guide. And oh, that's what nice. it will, it will be more of like, here's nautical rules. Here's maybe a couple of uh, class classes. Options, like, races. like you yeah. could be a purple dragon knight from Cormier. You could be X, Y, and Z. And then here are location info. Um, mm -hmm. if you want to play in this area of the sea of fallen stars. And so that, I don't know, I, now I'm hyped up that, that should yeah. be, that would be really cool. But yeah, cause we haven't really got that style of campaign guide, right? Because that, that campaign guide didn't have an adventure attached to it. It was just rules no, yeah. that helped make you feel like you were playing in that area, yeah. which is a little different than what they've released, but it doesn't mean that they wouldn't go back and do something like that. But so the Sword yeah, Coast that, Adventures Guide helps out if you're playing Waterdeep Dragon that. Heist or Storm yeah. King's Thunder and things like that. Um, and so if they release something like this to coincide with the adventure that's coming up, uh, it kind of makes sense. So, yeah. I mean, well, and I I like books like that because of the lore that Jordan does uh, for his YouTube channel. But I understand that the Sword Coast Adventures Guide, I don't think it got as favorable, favorable reviews as I as I would have given it um, mm -hmm. in the long run. Like, I think a lot of people thought it was like, well, it only gives you like four spells and a couple of classes that aren't really worth it. And like the, th the whole row uh, or the ranger like section has nothing. Yeah. Swashbuckler was in it, but like the ranger section didn't have any archetypes for the ranger. It was just, here's what a ranger is in the sword coast. Um, so a lot of people were kind of like, eh, does it, what is, you know, they were, they wanted a Xanathar's guide and they didn't yeah. get that with Sword Coast Adventures Guide. But, um, uh, man, I'm flipping through that book constantly. What I'm doing, like, where are we at now? Like, Cormier, Sembia, like, Jacendia. I got to go through and, and find all the information. Um, so I use it a lot 
but I'm also playing my games in the Forgotten Realms. I'm doing a lot of stuff like that. So, well, it also makes sense that they make a game or makes the next book be something that players and DMs would want because Dungeon of the Mad Mage, which I just did a review on too, and I was I was reading through some of it, not enough to spoil it, but I wanted to go through and, and get it up on the channel. Mm -hmm. it's, it's clearly a dungeon master's book, so it's not one that players are going to race out and get because there's nothing in it to help them with oh, their characters. Oh well, yeah, their it's an adventure. Experience. Yeah. So it's got to be a lower selling book than the other ones. So I feel like if they just put that one out, so they put out Dragon Heist, they put out Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Those are great for Dungeon Masters for the most part, but we need a book now that's all the players are going to go and add to their shelves because it has some additional classes in it or it has some additional race options, sub-race options, or it, or it has some mechanics that are going to be mm -hmm. relevant or some magic spells or something that's relevant so that players say, oh yeah, we want this just as much as a dungeon master who's going to run a game in whatever it's talking mm -hmm. about wants it. Like, we, you know, the, the Ravnica book is, I think, is a really good version of, that's something a player could want and a dungeon master would want. That's a book that should have sold pretty well versus some of the adventure books, I think, that have just... And I don't know about the adventure books, but like on the stream they were saying like ravnica sold really well and it surprised me like uh, i got the book for christmas so i kind of read it a month late because it came out at early december i think and i got it towards the end of december but i was i was flipping through it and reading it and in fact one of the monsters is perfect for like the the big bad end guy that i want to incorporate into the shadow fell campaign that i want to do so i'm just like oh it's worth it just for this monster stat like i was really excited um I don't think I'll run anything in Ravnica, but I like the idea of the renowned system and kind of uh, leveling up in a guild, leveling up in something like that. Oh, yeah, so you can yeah. definitely take that skeleton framework and apply it to your game. And so I was thinking maybe if, if my players are in the Shadowfell, I'll have like not 10 guilds, but like three, and they can choose one of the three and they'll get special perks if they level up within this guild and do missions for said guild and stuff like that. Um, yeah. So the the ideas are really great in Ravnica, but I was surprised that it sold so well because mm -hmm. nobody asked for Magic the Gathering in my D&D. &D. Like, like uh, I read one really good review where they were like, who asked for this book? Like, nobody asked. Did you? Did you really? <laughs> <laughs> I sent it in every day. Yeah. I do. I've, I've wanted this for a long you time. You wanted a crossover of it like this? Because yes. that was yeah. the review I was reading. He was saying, like, I don't think anybody asked for this book, so why did they make it? And it was not a good review of the Ravnica book. I think it's it's selling well, and it, it reviewed better in other places. This just one uh, yeah. Canadian reviewer was like, it's not worth your $60 or something, so but Canadian, sorry. No. Yeah. Can you do? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but no, uh, now I want to talk about Ravnica. So like what, yes. what were you a magic player back in the day? And you were kind of like, why can't I use these magic things or. Well, it was once the merger happened when I went. So, you know, because eventually before that you have magic and you have Dungeons and Dragons and they're yeah. not related in any way. And then the company buys them and now they're a related company. And I always thought, because Magic the Gathering is the one kind of fantasy card game that although it's competitive and you play it and you're just racing through stuff and you're tapping mana and you're casting spells, I definitely was a Magic player that was trying to imagine. I even wrote some stories mm -hmm. of a battle. Like, I would do the battle. It was like a four-round battle, but I wanted to make that a narrative. What would it, what did it, how would it read or how would it look like narratively? And so my mind always imagines me playing like that it's not just a game it's not just moving tokens on a board and, and it i always turned it into a story and so with dungeons and dragons being turning your imagination into a story playing this card game was doing the same thing and i was i wanted to i was reading some of the books they put out and it was this cool idea of this cool high level wizard planeswalker thing that could summon and do these cool things mm -hmm. and so yeah i definitely wanted that in dungeons and dragons but it was like nobody wanted that those two things did not want to mix for a very long time. And there's still even a lot of people right now that say that should not mix. It's like the people that will say peanut butter and chocolate should never mix or the people that, you know, <laughs> but there's a big group of us that love peanut butter and chocolate. I get that you don't like that stuff, but I really like it. And I think it's a taste thing. So I think their artwork is fantastic. I think the oh, worlds yeah. they evoke are so imaginative. And the creatures, like I was just playing the other day, we we're talking about we've been playing Magic the Gathering Arena, and I was looking at some of the cards, and I looked at that card, and I said, I want to make the character that is the Loxodon Linebreaker. It's just a, 
you know, it's like a three, two card that you put out there and it's, it's kind of a throwaway for anybody that plays magic and they don't really care about Dungeons and Dragons. But when I look at that, it's this cool character standing there with this big two handed hammer. And I'm like, I want to know this dude's story. I want to play what this is. What is this Loxodon line breaker? What is the whole thing behind what's going on? How do I play that character? Mm -hmm. So for me, I think there's a lot of reading into it. And I was hoping that there was a big, I was optimistic because I felt like I was going to be another one of those people where I enjoyed it, but then there was this big internet backlash of people that hated it, right? So I'd, all, I'd be on the back, similar to other things that have happened that I've liked, and then other people have just slammed. Like, I like No Man's Sky, but it got hammered by everybody and everywhere about how bad of a game it was, and how they lied to us and all this stuff. And I'm like, but I got in and I liked playing it. I don't, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the people that liked it. So, but I'm glad that I, I think everybody I've talked to about Ravnica, they've actually enjoyed it. They liked the book because it was presented in a story fashion, not in a let's make Dungeons and Dragons magic fashion, right? Yeah. There's not all of a sudden, all of your magic is now you must tap the five different mana crystals and here's your five mana points to cast your fireball or whatever. They didn't do that. And I think because they didn't do that, the book's a success. I think had they tried to turn it too much into magic using like their magic system and, and went too far with it, they could have shot themselves in the foot. But they went the story route which is the best route to go with that is the only route I think to go with it. So I think they knocked it out of the park with that book. Yeah. And one of the things on the stream, they were saying, uh, will we see the opposite? Like, will you make a magic, the gathering expansion that is dungeons and dragons? Um, yeah. And that was something that I'm like, well, I don't, I don't play a lot of magic. I've been playing magic, the gathering arena cause it's free and it's been fun. And I like card yeah. games. Well, I could see um, them bringing in more but... to as a planeswalker or just in that not change it in any other direction no other that's yeah let's bring in mordekainen as a planeswalker let's bring in um the soulmonger let's bring you know bring in these big super l minister serac or something dudes, yeah. Sarac, yeah 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 and then give them a color deck of some craziness and then and then that would be the tie-in other than that yeah so i don't know uh it could be really cool like in importing like these literary figures like or like these these characters from the novels um or just like uh orcs like you have yeah, yeah, you know the, the they're already in yeah they're there and like you just kind of throw a, a dungeons and dragons flavor on them like the uh many arrows orcs or something like that yeah, um, yeah. i could see a card that is like a a, a red wizard of fey and it turns yeah. out to be like a 2-2 two -two character that can throw you know can do if you pay a certain amount of mana can do one point of fire damage to something else you know or, or mm -hmm. you know just like they could pick out these little things like you said the dragon the purple dragon knights or you know all these little things they could grab out or even just real heroes or water davian guard or mm -hmm. a statue from water water deep or, and actually now that we're talking about that th yeah. that makes me really excited like i would totally play a card game set in the forgotten realms just because i know so much of the lore that would yeah. be really fun. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be good. I like that idea. So it, we do like the idea. I like the idea of the blending. I think it's okay if they do it, not overdo it, obviously. Um, I think both are very strong IPs on their own. Yeah. But I would like to see some crossover. And I think it should be story crossover, not mechanics crossover. No, because yeah. I think they've, they've worked on the mechanics. They know what they're doing. They don't need to change their games to do those things. They're fun games on their own. But let's intermingle some of the story elements, I think, would be fun. Yeah, for sure. Hmm. I don't know. Kind of a started off talking about nautical ships, and now we're going back into Ravnica. Back to Ravnica. We love Ravnica. Um, well, I have look I it up really my, quick. What was your favorite book of, of 2018? Oh. The ones released. What was released? What was the one? What was your favorite one for 2018? And I'll, while you're looking them up, because well, for I me. Gotta, like, yeah, released. In yeah yeah for I'm me googling it right now <laughs> xanathar's guide is at the top yeah um and it's it's the best just because of the most options we got and uh, oh somebody said you're still streaming magic arena i was like oh yeah yeah i do some of that <laughs> not, yeah, right now. I'm not streaming right now yeah yeah i do um but well xanathar's was 2017 okay then ravenica is my favorite Really? Okay. Because I was just going to say Ravnica is number two to Xanathar's, but if Xanathar's was 2017, then Ravnica was my favorite 2018 book. Uh, Mordekainen's Tome of Foes. Pretty good. 
uh, Waterdeep Dragon Heist. Yeah. And Ravnica and Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Yeah. So Ravnica, hands down, was my favorite then. Yeah. They don't release a lot of books. I always, like, I was just like, oh, that doesn't seem like a lot. But yeah, that makes sense. Uh, that was May of 2018 was Morden Canaan's, according to this website. Um, you know what? I'm going to, even though this wasn't a D and D wizards of the coast book, I think they, ha- they had a hand in it, but the art and arcana book that came out. Um, I don't know if you picked that up. You should. I didn't, um, but I should. You should. I'm waiting and for it to go on <laughs> yeah, wait for it to go on sale. It's kind of expensive. I picked it yeah, up. Yeah. Um, came out on my birthday, so I think it was a birthday present to myself. But uh, really, it was a fun read. It's a fun coffee table book. Like when I have friends over and I'm trying to, they're like, I don't know, just uh, we like we ran Tomb of Horrors and there's a whole mm-hmm. Tomb of Horrors section in that book. And I showed my friends, I was like, these are like the original maps that he drew. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, these are the original maps that he drew for the Tomb of Horrors. And people were just like, whoa, that's so, oh, hey, we were there. Like, we did this and this and this. And I'm like, I know. But that was, I think that was my favorite book of 2018. Uh, with Morden Kanan's Tome of Foes being a close second, because I like all the lore that they added in. I so. do like that book. I like the demons and the devil stories. I like the the new creatures as a DM. All high-level creature stuff, too, which I really yeah. like. Um, I love that I got the alternate cover on it and it looked really good. Uh, the story behind Morden Kanan. But for me, Ravnica was a breath of fresh air of something different, of 10 guilds vying over this mega world of a city. And I felt like it was a better city companion book than even Waterdeep was. Because Waterdeep um, Dragon Heist was really good, but it was very specific to Waterdeep. And it would have been hard to use the rules from that book, but then make it into your own homebrew big city. You could have done it, but there would have been a lot of tweaking that you would have had to do, a lot of work on the DM side to do it. Whereas the the the, the way the guilds interact with each other and they put that turmoil in and the way they give you mechanics in the Ravnica book to simulate the tensions between those things mm-hmm. and how to randomly generate it and how to create stories it was like something I hadn't have. Like Waterdeep is something I've seen before and it gave me some extra stuff, but it was kind of stuff I'd seen before or places my mind already was, mm-hmm. right? I was already in um, the Sword Coast. I'm already in Faerun. I'm already thinking of stories about how to work and, you know, what do we do with the Harpers and what do we do with the Zintarum and, you know, this kind of stuff. So my mindset was already there. Ravnica took me in my mind and said, hey, how about this brand new place? And I was like, oh yeah. And then, the, you know, synapses are firing and, what about this and that? And it's totally different. And so I think that's what it got for me. It's just the creativity and, and the artwork is so good. Sphinxes and and the the clans and the Azorius and just all this stuff. Um, you know, people dealing with debt and they get debt and that's how they get power and Demir spies and just all this really cool stuff, all based around color combinations that that build a palette for you. Mm-hmm. Um, creatively and artistically. So are you going to incorporate, to. are you going to incorporate it into your future games? Already have. Oh, okay. We had the Loxodon in the moment we had rules for Loxodon. We had a character in our Seeking Revenor campaign. We have a Loxodon. Um, and now that the book is out, I've let all my players, anything from that book is valid for character option wise or race option wise, sub, subclass, that kind of stuff. I do eventually this year, 2019, I have a plan for a short but several month campaign of I want to do a Ravnica game for sure. So I want to do a nice, short, concise campaign in Ravnica at some point. Okay. Be, really and then use the using the guilds and things like that and your yeah, players can yeah, collect renown. Yeah. I'm going to use stuff. the book the way yeah. it talks about roll this to figure out where the tension is, roll this to figure out how the players are involved, and then run a nice succinct storyline through it that maybe gets them through one or two levels of their character maybe started at a nice midway point maybe like a fourth or fifth level Mm six level start and then run it through and then just have it as a nice a nice little storyline thread that goes through and if they really like it and you know i'm really into it i'll keep it going but the idea is to keep a nice short campaign for it to see just to get into that that world Mm -hmm. so keep an eye out it's going to be on the channel (laughs) sweet sounds great 
Yeah. Uh, well, speaking of games, uh, what did you do in games this week, sir? This week was the return of Tomb of Annihilation, but we've changed our show. And here's the sad news. We have kicked Adventure League rules to the curb because what we have found is when you're playing with a group week in, week out, it's the same players that's never changing and you're deep in the jungles of Chult, Adventure League rules seem to work against you for reality. Mm. The idea that in between sessions, you can buy stuff from the merchants. In between sessions, you're spending weird treasure checkpoints. In between sessions, you're leveling super fast. Um, all this stuff, and if you die, there's nothing the players can do. The, D the GM's hands are kind of tied. Um, just there was a lot of restraint for the, the group that is the same group of people that are playing week in, week out. I don't mm -hmm. think those rules shine for that group the regular rules shine for the group that meets every week. Adventure League is great when you need rules that are going to accommodate people dropping in and out. Yeah. Then it makes sense. Then it makes sense to have small, concise adventures. And then in between those adventures, players are moving in and out and doing things. And then worrying about when, what tier can play with what other tier. Um, when do you tear out of something? So now you can't play that kind of thing. Those rules. I think because there's there multiple tables. Like that, yeah. that's, you have to remember that. Like you guys are showing up to one group and it's like, well, now I'm tier one and the rest of you are tier two. And it's like, well, in, in a setting of that, then the tier one guy would just go play with other tier ones and the tier two right. people will go play with that. It doesn't, yeah, it just doesn't work with you guys. Right. But we want to bring our turtle friend back who's been gone from the show for four months. They're tier one, but we're all tier twos. Mm -hmm. And so the mechanics don't work out as well. And I think the GM was just fighting with, um, he wanted to run it the way as written, but as you know, all of us dungeon masters always want to tweak and add things in. Yeah. And we don't want to, we want to be, and we sometimes forget, we, we forget to tell ourselves that it's okay to change what's there and what is written. He wanted to play it as what is written. And I think he was kind of, um, butting up against that idea of, I want to change this one thing, or I want to make this character a little bit different, or I want this to happen, but that's not how the book says it happens. So I'm going to keep going. So now We've kind of thrown that out. And the new show, which is called Role Plus Mod on a Narcissus channel, still Tomb of Annihilation, still the same characters. We're going to play through that hardcover book, and then we're going to choose another hardcover um, book from them, and we're going to play through that. It could be Dragon uh, It could be Dragon Heist. It could be Dungeon of the Mad Mage. It could be one of the older ones. But he'll pick a, an actual hardcover adventure, and we'll play through that on this show. So the show is going to be about playing the officially released material, with characters, just not necessarily the Adventure League version of that. Yeah. No, that's So it cool. was really good. And so even though we got rid of that, we had an epic battle of... We, we've got three characters in the group, and we're high-level characters, but we just had to fight 20 ghouls and ghasts. <clears throat> now, CR rating on these things are going to be pretty small, but let me tell you, when there is eight of them around you, and you've got to make a DC 10 saving throw to not be paralyzed from every single one of from those eight teams. attacks. Yeah. You're not going to make all eight successes. You're going to fail somewhere in there. And so we need, we nearly had a, a full on TPK from that. We nearly had, uh, we still might die out of it. The battles lasted so long that it's going into another session this coming up Tuesday mm -hmm. and we'll see how it's going to work. But it was close. And I mean, we're fighting, we're kicking, we're, we're using every ability that we possibly could. It looked bad. And the GM started the GM started the session rolling super high, right? And that's always throws... It happens to me in my games when I run them too, is that when we start the encounter, I roll really well for some weird reason. And my players <laughs> go into full-on panic mode because yeah. all of a sudden... 18s and 19s and 17s are hitting a 20 crits somebody and they're like that's it he's killed us we're done yeah but then we hit the middle part of the combat or the end and i start rolling terribly and all of a sudden they just pull it right back and they win and they beat it and then it's like to me as the gm is like oh that's pretty cool but to them it was like this huge panic mode he tried to kill us and it was like no no it was the dice it was like the dice make it so swingy sometimes that even a finely tuned encounter can just go horribly wrong or horribly different than you thought it was going to be just the way the dice start rolling. Mm -hmm. You know, your players roll bad, you roll good. 
and some goblins can kill your party if you roll good and they roll bad. Yeah. It doesn't matter how well you follow the CR rules. So I think sometimes we got to remember that and, and find ways to help our players understand, you know, sometimes the dice are against us and that's just, we'll run with it. That's what the storyline is going to be. Like it was so bad that I got stunned in the first turn, couldn't do anything. They're getting advantage. They're attacking me. They're, they're whittling down. I had like 85 hit points before I could move and do anything. I was down to like 30 hit points. Oh, wow. And I was like, I, I opened up Xanathar's guy and I started looking at what character I was going to play next because I was like, I'm stunned. There's nothing I can do. I'm paralyzed. And I missed one of the eight, you know, I made seven saves and I missed the eighth one. Oh, okay, wait till my next turn before I can do anything. So it's a tough one. And I think the, the GM didn't realize how, because he looked, I think, at, at the CR ratings, like, oh, okay, they're only CR, whatever. No big deal. These guys are eighth level and ninth level characters. And then all of a sudden, all were stun locked. <laughs> yeah. What do they call that? Uh, like, like when, a, when an enemy or when a player has more action, action economy. That's the yeah, one I'm looking economy, for. And so yeah. the action economy here, even though they're low CR creatures, you're still getting, I get a roll eight to nine D20s when you get a roll two. And mm-hmm. so it just kind of like, oh, shoot, like that's crazy. And it, and we we might be able to overcome it, but it's definitely been hit and miss. It's definitely been a Need crazy. Need a fireball. So that's on Tuesday night. See what the, yeah, if we only had some AOE damage, that would have been great. Like, I can do a ton of stuff as a barbarian, except I can't move for three rounds before mm-hmm. I got to actually swing my sword and kill something. And then I got stunned again, at one right after that. And then finally I started making the saves. We got our clear, it gave us bless, which gave us 1d4 to add. Here's mm-hmm. the crazy thing. I got a plus six on the con save. I only got to get to a 10. That means on all of those eight rolls, as long as I roll a higher than four on the D20, I've got it. And I still was missing one yeah. or two here or there. And so then I got the plus one D4 and I still missed one of those. <laughs> so it was crazy. It was pretty fun. So if you want to see the aftermath of that, come to our Tuesday show on Anaris' channel. And then, um, so that was the big thing. The only other thing that I have going on is Sunday, I want to do a brand new RPG session so i'm gathering some players up hopefully i've tried a couple of different sundays but with the holidays i didn't get any takers maybe this week will be different and what it is is i want to do this it probably is going to turn into a show at some point but i want to do i want to get a couple of them going before i i officially make it a show but it's this idea of recreating the you and your friends are high schoolers or middle schoolers you went to the bookstore to get your rpg which is where you used to go to get your whatever rpg you were going to play dun- the new dungeons and dragons or or whatever game you decided to grab you know a vampire masquerade or werewolf or you know whatever it was and then you took it home and then you learned it and you you played it and the idea is i want to grab an rpg i want to sit the players down we open the book together or the pdf in this case online we roll up characters we play some adventures and we play it for a full month and at the very end of the month most of that might be streamed at some point. I don't know, maybe not at first, but at the very end of the month, I want to do a video that kind of does a summary of what I thought of the whole month of play, mm-hmm. how character creation went, how the world was presented to us, how easy was it for us to pick up something brand new without us studying it and getting ready. It was just, we opened it and we got going and we got playing and what'd we get right, what'd we get wrong, what I liked about it and that kind of thing. And then do one of those for each month. So hopefully... If I can get this done right, I get 12 of those, right? Because we've got 12 months. So hopefully I have a January one where we pick and we have a February one and a March one. So I'm hoping that works out. I'm hoping that you fans in the show that have a a Sunday afternoon open, uh, maybe check it out on my Discord channel. Most of you are on my Discord channel. Let me know if you're you're free on Sunday and want to learn a new RPG, non-Dungeons & Dragons, for those of you, I know this is a Dungeons and Dragons show, but I want to expand the different um, tabletop RPGs that I'm playing. So that has been my week in Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, how has been Jordan's week in Dungeons and Dragons? So I ran a Dungeon Crawl Classics game, um, which uh, was fun. And but uh, we were talking earlier, like it went too long. Um, but I'll get into that a little bit. So, uh, dungeon crawl classics is this, like, I have a secret love affair with dungeon crawl classics. Not so secret, I guess. Um, I just really love how like brutal it is. And I played a zero level funnel where you take, you make four characters 
and then you run these four everybody has four characters so you might have like 16 characters at a table um, or 12 characters or something like that and then everybody uh, plays four characters and whoever wins or whoever lives at the end of the session because there's lots of death and dying because you're just a zero level peasant um, whoever lives goes on to be level one and then you play one character going forward and so it's really this kind of fun way where uh, you you get really attached to that character that has rolled um, a, a, a higher than a 15 every single time. You're like, Stuart's made that roll every single time. Like, he's just, he's invincible. He's going to be level one. Oh, no, he, he died in the next scene. Oh, that's really <laughs> sad. And it's funny and it's fun. So my players came over and I said I had a level one one shot that I wanted to run. And we did about an hour of leveling our characters up from the previous session. And then we played through this module called The Thing That Watches From Below. Um, or That Which Watches From Below. I can't remember off the top of my head. But it's all about eyeballs and fun stuff. And there's like weird curses where if you touch a, a gem or something, um, your eyeballs physically leave your body. And then you can like explore the dungeon with eyeballs going through all of this other stuff. Uh, but... How magic works is you have a, uh, you roll a d20 and then you look at a table. And if you roll a d20 on a natural one, that's real bad when you cast magic and you get something called corruption. So you don't want to roll a natural one. On a two through 11, you forget your spell and you can't actually cast it. On a 12 to 20, certain other things happen on a 21 to 25 it's even a better more powerful spell on a 26 to 30 it's even more powerful and a 30 plus it's like the most powerful spell you've ever done well if i'm rolling a d20 how do i get a 30 plus you do that by sacrificing your stats. So uh, in Dungeon Crawl Classics, there's a mechanic called Spell Burn, where I can burn my constitution, my agility, or my strength, and convert that into a higher roll. So if I want a plus 10 on my on my d20 roll, I can, um, like, and it, it has things like you cut off a finger, and so you lose, like, like three points of constitution and I like my muscles atrophy. And so I lose like six points of strength. And so all of a sudden, if I lose six and four, I then have a plus 10 to my roll. Mm -hmm. Well, we were fighting the big bad end guy and the wizard in our group was like, well, I just want to see how, how far can I push this? So he casts the spell sleep. And if you roll like a 15, you, you put a target to sleep. If you roll like a 20, you can put two targets to sleep. He spent uh, 20 points of spell burn. So he <laughs> pretty much just took his agility, I think, to one. And I think he took his, his strength to one and his agility down as well. And you have another modifier called luck that you can burn. So he burned all four of these things and, and got a plus 20 on the roll. He then rolled an 18. So Ooh. we're looking at a, a 38. Yeah. So we looked it up in the book. What's a 38? Well, it's a 32 plus. It kind of stops after 32. And he put all of the enemies in a coma-like sleep that will last for a um, hundred years was what the spell did. So it was really kind of, I guess why I'm bringing this up is it was really interesting to have like, okay, this is going to be such a sweet battle. He then put everybody to sleep and then walked around and just like shanked him dead. Like, oh, well, I'll just kill this guy, take a staff, kill this guy, kill this guy, kill this guy. And that was the climactic battle of our Dungeon Crawl Classics campaign, <laughs> which kind of blew me away. Um, yeah. The game went too long. Uh, I think with character, I think if I'm going to do this again, I'm going to have character creation be a separate day and then mm -hmm. we will, uh, or leveling up your character because nobody was familiar with the system. So there was lots of questions and then we ended up playing for like four hours. So it was like a five hour, five and a half hour session, um, which maybe I'm just getting old, but like, I like three to four hours of RPGs and then I'm usually done. And I could tell mm -hmm. that my players were the same way where they were like, Oh, and, and I look at like current shows and stuff. Nobody really goes beyond a four hour mark unless you're doing a charity stream or something. But like, that kind of seems like the norm. Like how often do you play your games? Yeah. Well, because I've been doing online and because I've been doing streaming, I followed kind of the streaming template, which is kind of like the three hour yeah. mark. Um, and so everything I've done has been somewhere around two to three hours, very rarely a four hour, four hours starts to really drag though. I know a lot of the, the, the popular 
stream shows go for their well, four hours. Like Critical Role goes for four plus hours sometimes. Yeah, and, he'll go yeah. to the story doesn't stop. Yeah, yeah. So they have some definite late ones. I do know that before now, we used to play four, five, six hour sessions, but that's because we would show up at somebody's house. Yeah. We would order dinner. We would be there the whole time and it just, the time would fly and it would go by a lot quicker, I think, when it was in that setting. So we had a lot more binge playing, but then again, we would only play every two weeks or something yeah. or, you know, so it wasn't necessarily weekly um, where I found the online games have not gone that long. Um, so I'm, I pretty much play right now about a yeah. three to four hour game. I think that's on. what I've just gotten used to. And when we all of a sudden had like a five hour game, I was even dragging. I'm just like, and okay, well, I'm going to cut this part out. I'm going to cut this part out, but we still have to have this climactic fight. So we got to like, you know, get here and here and here. So, but yeah, it pushed me like when I went and did the um, convention games and they gave me a slot that was a four hour slot, mm -hmm. I got I got a little anxious because I'm like, wait a minute, all the games I run are three hours. What am yeah. I going to do for the fourth hour? And it always worked out, even though I had nothing planned and I had no idea how I was going to stretch the content for four extra, for an extra hour. It always did seem to work out that I was able to fill it up at the time. But going into it, I was like, oh my God, there's, there's this small adventure. This is mm -hmm. going to take an hour to do or whatever. But then, you know, players go off on their own weird tangents and if you don't rein them in you can burn all kinds of time if you let them yeah it's a gazebo i want to inspect the gazebo yeah. all right you inspect the gazebo you find you've learned who built it and there's nothing <laughs> to do with the story but let's spend an hour on it i'm fine with that i need to kill an hour yeah <laughs> it's fun i've been reading um i bought a rpg book called maze of the blue medusa um mm -hmm. i don't know if you've heard of it Yes. Um, it's system agnostic, so it's like you can use this with any role-playing game, but it actually has monster stats in there, but they make the monster stats really uh, ambiguous. Like, this monster has three hit die and a plus three to its attacks, but you kind of decide how much damage the attack needs to do or things like that, and what is three hit die? Like, is it 3d10, 3d6? You mm -hmm. kind of decide that based on the game you're playing. But the more I was reading it, I'm like, these monster stats reflect really well with how Dungeon Crawl Classic monster stats are. And so now I want to run Maze of the Blue Medusa as a Dungeon Crawl Classics game. Um, and I've got some friends that are interested, so I might like I might do that. I might say, uh, rather than running the whole maze, because it's a really big book, I'll be like, we're going to do section one. And mm -hmm. we'll just spend like two days kind of exploring this and see how well you guys do. But uh, it, it's yeah. system agnostic, but it's by people that do a lot of OSR stuff, yeah. right? So it makes sense that it's that very, it works with very Venture Crawl. compatible with yeah. OSR. Yeah. But uh, it's it was really interesting. Like rather than it was a cool way of giving you monsters, I guess, because rather than uh, like Hot Springs Island, I felt like I had to find the D and D five E equivalent of that monster for Hot Springs Island. And in Maze of the Blue Medusa, I'm like, no, I can create a monster based on the information they gave me that fits. And so that's kind of like a, a fun idea. Like, oh, it can cast spells. Well, now I'll, I'll create a monster that has, you know, X, Y, and Z spells, as well as two hit dice, and it has a plus three to attack and things like that. So kind of fun. And I've been reading that cool. like a lot lately. And then ultimately, I guess what I wanted to talk about is the Shadowfell. And the conclusion to my uh, inverted pyramid game that my players have been running through. Uh, how long has this ran for so far? Oh, man. I think June. We've been in the pyramid thing. since yeah, yeah, June. Yeah. Okay. Um, so they they defeated a simulacrum of King Necros, but they knew they had to like go back and actually take care of the real King Necros. I was expecting them to talk to him. Uh, they, long story short, they got on their magic carpet and like flew through it. And I'm just kind of like, oh, they'll probably want to be like, like get some exposition or something. But they went in like secrets, uh, super stealth. We want to just hit him hard as before he can even talk, we want to <laughs> attack him. So they got yeah. none of that out of them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they Murder ran hobos. in what? Murder hobos. Murder hobos. 100%. <laughs> yeah. So they ran in and, uh, just straight started attacking him. The only characters that I had was I had a devil um, and a and uh, King Necros himself, uh, who was kind of operating this machine. Now, I borrowed this machine from Out of the Abyss. It's called the Maze Engine, and it has a whole table of random effects that happen. So during this entire fight, at the top of the round, I would roll for a random effect, and weird things would happen. 
That's cool. They ended up uh, attacking King Necros, taking him down, uh, which was kind of cool. After a couple of, like, he, he sent one guy hurling through hell, which was really cool. The guy reappears after hurling through the nine hells, taking 10d10 damage, which was just, like, ridiculous. And a super powerful mm -hmm. monster. I got it from Creature Codex. It was the... Uh, the warlock lich i think and so uh, i kind of changed king necros from being like a powerful wizard to he made a pact with the devil and now he's this like this undead lich warlock kind of creature um and the devil was there to kind of observe and make sure that he's like holding up to his pact that he he's made so i could have king necros come back at some point but my my players annihilated him because they like ants on sugar just like we got to destroy this guy as quickly as possible but then they were left with the conundrum of we have a devil here who's not really attacking us but is kind of just laughing at us and, and observing and we still have this like pyramid full of undead creatures like what do we do with this pyramid um and meanwhile the maze engine is is sp uh, you know doing random effects and so i think one of them they they all got teleported around in a room and another effect is they were all blind for a little bit and another effect um ended up doing a bunch of damage and the next turn ended up healing that bunch of damage like anybody that was a lawful creature got healed a whole bunch so it was, it was really fun their final idea was we need to crash the pyramid into the dirt before it, it arrives at the city so she rolls uh our our cleric rolls a really good arcana check she can now control the pyramid she angles it down into the ground which then tilted the pyramid everybody towards this open portal to the shadow fell i forgot to mention that there's a portal to the shadow fell that was open <laughs> he's like siphoning energy off from the shadow fell to power his uh his pyramid uh. so there's this open portal so they're now they're dangling at that same moment i rolled randomly on the maze engine and it said that the maze engine spewed oil over the entire surface of the um of the, the 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 entire floor surface so now they had disadvantage on their dexterity checks to hold on and not fall in Mm -hmm. and everybody fell in except for the monk and the monk was hanging out there and like do i go with the rest of my party and he was like do i even know where this goes he rolled a religion check to see where he thinks it goes and i said and he rolled really well and so i said you know kind of everything fit into place like the weird um like insanity that you guys have been having um, within the pyramid, the like overwhelming despair that you feel like this is a portal that's going to take you to the shadow fell. And he's like, do I know things about the shadow fell? And I'm like, you know that like you won't die there. People can live there, but it is, it is a place of the dead. It's where the dead go. And he's like, okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what do you want to do? He's like, I want to use my eye of Savras, which is that like wand of wonder that does random magical effects. But we always say it's the will of Savras, the God Savras. He's like, I want to use that on the maze engine to destroy it and hopefully destroy the pyramid. And it was one of those cool moments where I said, instead of actually rolling on the table, I want to do like the rule of cool. Like Savras mm -hmm. has answered your prayers. What do you want to have happen? And he's like, I want the machine to be destroyed and I want the pyramid to like stop flying and crash into the ground. So when he used his Eye of Savras, it broke apart this machine. Um, the maze engine started swirling around, got sucked into the portal, and then he let go and fell into the portal. And that's where we ended the game. And so they're going to wake up in the Shadowfell, and we're going to have a whole brand new adventure of you guys are in the Shadowfell. Um, still with how do I get home, but on a better track to get home, I think. Because they're not stuck in the middle of nowhere. They have like they've gone through portals and they can find more portals home kind of a thing. So it was really cool. And everybody was saying like, that's so cool that, that you rolled randomly and the oil went everywhere to pull us in. And I'm like, no, it was just kind of, it randomly happened and it was really exciting. And it was a cool climactic fight that we had at the yeah, end. That, that was my question. Like what was the energy in the room? Oh, was, yeah. The final dice is thrown the final thing in the final moment where you say, and that's where we end today's session. Yeah that moment right after that what was the what was the energy or what was the was it just like a sigh of relief was it like excitement for what's coming up next was it yeah. like 
oh my god what just happened what was the the whole thing going it on it was like an oh my god what just happened but it was also like i think they're really excited to see where the story's going to go and that uh, they get to keep these characters and that they ended up defeating yet another big bad guy that was out to like destroy the world and mm -hmm. i'm really excited because i could have king necros come back like, I like this idea that it's like, he's a lich. I mean, he, mm -hmm. he was thwarted, but like, they didn't destroy a phylactery or anything. So based on whatever contract he has with one of the devils of the nine hells, I mean, I could have him come back as a, as an interesting villain later on. And so maybe I will, we'll see. Yeah. Cause you could, then you could go right into your morning cannons book and you could have yeah the players get the demons to help them break the contract of the devil because the demons and the devil are at war yeah and who best to get as an ally except the enemy of your enemy <laughs> um the sad part about all of this is that we're going to take a break from D. &D. Oh. i know uh, i was like i was really excited to keep playing but um one of my one of my players bought the betrayal at house on the hill legacy game Oh yeah, and we are big fans of Betrayal at House on the Hill, and so we were like, well, let's pause D and D, and we'll play Betrayal Legacy for a little bit, um, maybe like ten or twelve sessions. I'm not sure how long the actual game is. So this is going to give me ample time to create um, more of a of, of a coherent story, I think, for the Shadowfell and where I want to take my players and things like that. Rather mm -hmm. than I have been, I have felt rather that I've been making it up week by week, and right. so now it's kind of like, oh, I can. I can manipulate this a little bit more. And so um, mm -hmm. we'll see, we'll see what happens. Uh, mm -hmm. I still have my hot Springs Island game and I still have another D and D game that I'm playing in. So it's not like I won't be playing any dungeons and dragons, but my main campaign is going to be on hiatus for a little bit, which uh, surprisingly I think I'm okay with. Cause like I said, it gives me some we time to break. Yeah. yeah. Breaks are Brain. good. It gives me a time yeah. to be a player again and to prep, uh, prep some Shadowfell adventure fun. So that is awesome. That sounds like a busy week. It is. It was a busy week. And then tonight I I ran into a friend who was like, hey, you published that Dragon on the Mount game. And I was like, yeah. And she said, well, I was going to buy it, but I actually want to play in it. Would you be willing to run it? And I'm like, if you find four other players or three other players, so there's four of you, I'll totally run it. And she did. She ran out and grabbed a bunch of friends. So they're going to come over to my house tonight and we're going to play Dragon on the Mount, which will be really exciting because uh, a, a module I'm very familiar with. So it should be like just low key and fun. And I can have yeah. a couple beers and play some some Dungeons and Dragons. So excited for that. And get some more people into it. Always, always spread that, yeah. that, that love of the hobby. <laughs> yeah, different, different new players. I think one of them is brand new to D&D. &D. Um, oh, awesome. The other one doesn't play a lot. And then two of them are, are veterans. They played when they were like younger, but I don't know if they played fifth edition. So this will be really fun. I'm excited to, to run some games for some new people. So, yeah. And that's what I did in gaming. So lots of exciting cool. Shadowfell adventures. DCC kind of ended on this like weird note of putting everybody to sleep, but we had a lot of fun. And now I want to run a Maze of the Blue Medusa Dungeon Crawl Classics game. So su super fun. <laughs> Super cool. Justin in chat says, congrats on 50 episodes. And I want to say congrats to you, Mr. Lucian, on 50 episodes. This has, been, this has been a full, almost a full year. I guess next week it'll be a full year of um, Saturday morning D&D show. So that's really exciting. Cool. Yeah, and there's so much more coming. And we're super excited just to keep things going. And we just love talking about Dungeons & Dragons, role-playing games in general, all the stuff that we're doing. So... And we're glad you guys come here and join us. And if yeah. you missed it, then join us on YouTube because it'll be out on YouTube and you'll be able to see it there too. And, and get in there and comment and start that conversation going because those are always good conversations too. Yeah. I've gotten some good tips out of there. Like, hey, go look at this resource for this thing. Yeah. Comments in that area. I'm like, oh yeah, let me write that down. I'm going to go check that out. So. Yeah. No, we love reading your comments. So please feel free to comment, uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel because that's where you can find all of our uh, uh, not only backlog of the Saturday morning D&D show, but other little pet projects that we like to do, we upload to that channel. So there's like extra fun stuff every once in a while. Um, yeah, anything else, sir? No, I'm going to do something special today at the end of the show, though, just for our fan here, Chaotic Magnet. Ooh. After we're done, I'm going to play a quick couple rounds of Magic the Gathering Arena right Sweet. here. Right when Jordan says we're signing off, we're going to do it. I'm going to switch over and I'm going to play 
until I lose. <laughs> you, once, once we lose, we're done. <laughs> you should play, uh, well... Hmm. I'm going to play the Pandemonium Constructed event that's going on right oh, okay. now. I was about to say, like, you should play a game against me, because that would be fun, too. Oh, we could do that, too. <laughs> that would be pretty fun. Oh, we could if you want to sign in. All right, I can do that. Um, but I'm going to end the stream here on YouTube. Yes. Um, we'll keep it up on Twitch. If you want to watch us play Magic Gathering Arena, you can switch over to Twitch. Uh, and thanks again, everybody, for coming out for a wonderful show of the Saturday Morning D&D Show. We will see you next week with another episode where we talk Bye. more Dungeons & Dragons and the various games that we've played. Thanks again for watching, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.